In this video, I'll be answering viewers' questions on testing for multiple sclerosis. If you'd like to better understand the testing we use to diagnose and monitor MS, don't turn away, because that starts right now. Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. Today I'm answering viewers' questions surrounding the topic of testing. Testing that is used both to help diagnose multiple sclerosis and to monitor the response to therapy and progression of disease. I'm using this awesome koozie that was sent to me by a viewer in Australia. Thank you very much. Ah, let's jump in. I have two questions on essentially the same topic. The first one is written by Chris Cunningham, who asks, what strength Tesla MRI do you recommend using for an annual MRI? Patty Randall asks, Dr. Boster, can three Tesla MRI see brain lesions that 1.5 Tesla cannot? Well, thank you both for asking the question. The MRI remains the most powerful biomarker that we have in MS. It gives us insights into what's going on underneath the hood, if you will. It can help us clinch an MS diagnosis, and it can certainly tell us whether or not there's breakthrough disease on MS therapy. In my opinion, people with MS taking a disease-modifying therapy deserve to have an MRI of the brain at least once a year. These questions are asking specifics about the strength of the scanner. And the, the MRI machine is a giant magnet. And the unit of measurement used is Tesla. And so the higher the Tesla number, the more powerful the magnet. Now in the early 1980s, when MRI was first invented, they had a 0.7 Tesla. When I started in clinical practice, it wasn't uncommon to see a 1.0 or 1.5 Tesla scanner. Nowadays, we do all of our imaging on three Tesla scanners whenever that's available. And in fact, the higher strength magnet can see more. Now that doesn't mean that a 1.5 Tesla scanner is useless. If the 1.5 Tesla scanner is properly protocoled and is carefully read, you can still see a lot of good stuff on it. But given my druthers, I absolutely would much prefer that scanning be done on a three Tesla scanner. It's a more powerful magnet and quite honestly, you can see more. There's one important consideration in addition to the strength of the scanner. And that's what I made reference to earlier, the, the protocol used. When you're having an MRI, you want to have the thinnest cuts possible. I like to do one millimeter cuts. Sometimes in community scanners, you can see these really thick cuts like five millimeters or even 7.5 millimeters. And that's horrible because what you're doing is you're taking a lot of brain and averaging it into one picture. <clears throat> in doing so, you end up losing a lot of detail. Also in the protocol, you don't want a gap. Sometimes in a community scanner, in order to get done quicker, they'll measure a segment of brain and then literally skip part of the brain. And so the ideal protocol is a thin slice, ideally one millimeter, and no gap. And that's true whether you're using a three Tesla or a 1.5. Chris and Patty, thank you for the awesome questions. It is August in Ohio and guys, it is hot out. I wanted to film in my backyard so I could share uh, the beauty of Ohio with you, as well as this fantastic koozie. Mama Bear Norton asks, can a CT scan read lesions? Mama Bear Norton, thank you for the question. And the simple answer is no, not very well. If you have a really large MS lesion, the CT scanner might pick it up. But largely speaking, the CT scanner is a very poor way of measuring MS. I would not recommend using a CT scan to try to diagnose MS, and I would not recommend using a CT scan to monitor disease activity. You're simply going to miss the vast majority of lesions. MRI technology is infinitely superior, and I really wouldn't use CT for this purpose at all. This next question shifts gears away from imaging and asks about testing of vision. This question is brought to us by viewer Elizabeth Hayes, who asks, what does it mean if you have trouble with the contrast acuity test, but you still can see 2020? So let's unpack this question. When you stand in the hallway and look down the hall at the eye chart, where there's a bunch of black numbers or letters, 
and on a white background. That's typically referred to as a Snellen chart. And the, the numbers or letters get smaller as you go from the top to the bottom. Now more specifically, that is a high contrast visual acuity chart. It's high contrast because there's jet black letters on a totally white background. It turns out that when you're measuring vision, and you're screening for subtle changes from an optic neuritis, as commonly seen in MS, high contrast acuity isn't really all that awesome. And in fact, a high contrast acuity can miss damage to the optic nerves. We prefer to use low contrast visual acuity. Low contrast acuity is when you don't have a black letter on a white background, so instead you have a gray letter on a white background. And as you go from the top of the chart to the bottom, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter. This is a very challenging test, but it's much more accurate to pick up subtle changes in visual acuity caused by damage to the optic nerves, like an optic neuritis. Now, I'm not telling you that a high contrast chart is useless. It's not useless, but it doesn't give you the important information that you're really going for. And when I'm screening someone that has multiple sclerosis, it's my strong preference to use a low contrast visual acuity. And the ideal is a 2.5%, which is 2.5% of black, so very, very light gray on a white background. Thank you for the awesome question. The next question comes from Outback MSer, who writes, in your opinion, Dr. B, is the 25 meter timed walk an accurate measurement? Take care. Well, thanks for the question, Outback MSer. There's a test we use called the timed 25 foot walk. Now the timed 25 foot walk is a measurement of speed. You have the patient stand at the ready mark and then they're instructed to walk as fastly as they can safely down the hall and they're walking 25 feet, not meters, but feet. Now this test can be accomplished by a healthy control in maybe three, four or five seconds and it's a very sensitive test for change in MS. A 20% change in the speed of walking is actually both clinically and statistically significant. This is maybe one of the single very best tests that we can use when monitoring ambulatory patients with MS. I strongly believe that we need to do a timed 25 foot walk with every ambulatory patient every single visit. Today's last testing question comes from viewer Mary Lou Clement who writes, Dr. B, could you please explain what oligoclonal bands are in the spinal tap for MS? Mary Lou, that's a great question. Now, I've actually done a video on this topic and I'll throw a link right up here in case you'd like a deeper dive into oligoclonal bands. But in brief, what you're doing is you're putting a needle into the spinal sac and you're pulling out clear spinal fluid. At the same day, you're collecting blood. And then you look at the amount of antibodies in the spinal fluid as compared to the antibodies in the blood. And if you see a disproportionately high number of antibodies in the spinal fluid as compared to the blood, this means that there's overly active inflammation in the central compartment, in the brain and spinal cord compartment. This doesn't diagnose multiple sclerosis, however, it's seen in upwards of 90% of people that are impacted by MS. Now in the 2017 revised diagnostic criteria, we integrated the oligoclonal bands as part of the diagnostic criteria. And so it can help you get closer to a diagnosis. When you think about prognosis, there are some papers that suggest that patients that have bands have a worse long-term prognosis than others. Keep in mind, please, that doing a spinal tap is not a requirement to make the diagnosis, but if the information is collected, we certainly want to take advantage of it. Thank you for the question. If you'd like to learn more about testing and multiple sclerosis, check out this playlist right there. YouTube thinks that you would adore this video right there. And if you've yet to subscribe to the channel, please consider doing so. Just click that circle with my face in it. Go ahead, click my face. My name's Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. Until my next video or live stream, take care.